chapter, which is mainly a continuation of chapter 5, Marx finally arrives at the solution where the surplus value in M prime is created. We are therefore forced to the conclusion that the change originates in the use value of the commodity, i.e. in its consumption. As we saw in the previous chapter, Marx determined that the increase of value in MCM prime cannot possibly occur in circulation itself. The exchange of M to C is merely a change of form. The commodity is just the transformed value of the money. The same goes for the exchange of C to M. The solution to this problem must therefore take place in the commodity which is bought in the first act of circulation, C. However, it cannot be its exchange value, so that leaves only one option. The change can originate only in the actual use value of the commodity, in its consumption. The question here is, is there a commodity, a source of value, which is the embodiment of human labour and that its use value is also able to create value? Is there such a commodity that somebody can purchase? Yeah, labour power. By labour power, or capacity for labour, is to be understood the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces a use value of any description. Marx doesn't go into too much explanation on human labour as a commodity in this chapter. However, he does specify a few conditions that must be fulfilled in order for a market of human labour to be made possible under capitalism. Firstly, quite simply, that there must be a demand for it. Somebody must be willing to purchase the power of human labour. Secondly, that the human labourer or worker must be willing to sell it freely. The worker and the owner of money meet in the market and deal with each other on the basis of equal rights, with only one difference, that one is a buyer, the other a seller, both therefore equal in the eyes of the law. Though the worker may only sell it for a limited period of time, if they were to sell it all in one go, they would be selling themselves completely, converting themselves from a free person into a slave. The last essential condition needed for the owner of money to find labour power on the market is that the workers cannot produce commodities independently of capital. The means or options of producing commodities for themselves must not be available to the worker. If they were available, they would simply not need to sell their labour. If I could produce my own food, my own house, my own footballs, I would not need to sell my labour to afford to buy those things. For the conversion of his money into capital, therefore, the owner of money must meet in the market with the free labourer. Free in the double sense, that as a free man he can dispose of his labour power as his own commodity, and that on the other hand he has no other commodity for sale, in short of everything necessary for the realisation of his labour power. From these conditions alone we can already get a sense of how they are interlinked. There can only be a market if there's a buyer and a seller of labour power. If a worker cannot produce their own means of subsistence, the things they need for survival or just enjoyment, then they must sell their labour power in order to pay for those things, which in turn continues the demand for the purchase of their labour power on the market. So we can already see that maybe their willingness to sell their labour power might not be quite as willing as it first appears. The question why this free labourer confronts him in the market has no interest for the owner of money, who regards the labour market as a branch of the general market for commodities, and for the present it interests us just as little. We cling to the fact theoretically as he does practically. One thing, however, is clear. Nature does not produce on the one side owners of money or commodities, and on the other men possessing nothing but their own labour power. This relation has no natural basis, neither is its social basis one that is common to all historical periods. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older forms of social production. What Marx means by labour power is not concrete labour, He's not talking about a specific type of labour, like woodworking or teaching or football making, 
but an individual human's ability to perform labour, their ability to perform work. It's labour in the abstract, the creation of commodities, the creation of value. But we now have to examine how this value is determined. Quite simply, the same as every other commodity, by the socially necessary labour time needed for its production and reproduction. Labour's individual value is determined as a slice of society's ability to produce labourers and its necessary means for labourers to replace themselves, having children and the necessary means for labourers to learn how to labour, whether that's on the job directly or through education. It's also determined by society's labourers to reproduce their individual labour powers. People must eat, have somewhere to sleep, have clothes to keep warm, some type of medical aid if they're unwell, essentially maintenance of their labour power. If they don't, they cannot perform their labour for long. Marx notes that the factors needed for both production and reproduction are a historical and moral element. The things societies need for their production and reproduction of labour shift and change over the course of history, but the value of labour is determined by the social time of a society to produce and reproduce this commodity, just the same as any other. While it's not a good example, and it's a subject Marx returns to in a later chapter, but if we consider the pay of minimum wage, then this is an amount in monetary terms that has been determined with these very factors in mind. An amount of money determined as an equal exchange for the value of an individual labourer to produce and reproduce themselves as labourers. This would also imply that there's a minimum limit, a sort of threshold that if the labourer fell below, they would not be able to perform as a labourer for very long due to illness, starvation or even death. The minimum limit of the labour power is determined by the value of the commodities without the daily supply of which the labourer cannot renew his vital energy. Consequently, by the value of those means of subsistence that are physically indispensable. If the price of labour power falls to this minimum, it falls below its value, since under such circumstances it can be maintained and developed only in a crippled state. But the value of every commodity is determined by the labour time requisite to turn it out so as to be of normal quality. The use value of labour power, as far as the buyer is concerned, is its ability to create value. They are not particularly concerned with what the labourers needs for the money or their subsistence are. They are only concerned with a peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption and use is therefore an objectification of labour, hence the creation of value. But how does this, the buying of labour power, which on the surface appears as an equal exchange, explain the creation of surplus value in M prime? For the answer to that, we must look elsewhere. We therefore take leave for a time of this noisy sphere, where everything takes place on the surface and in view of all men, and follow them both into the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold their stares is in the face, no admittance except on business. Here we shall see not only how capital produces, but how capital is produced. We shall at last force the secret of profit-making.